Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Trino here. Today I'm working on behalf of the Streisand effect. I made a short a little while ago where I pointed out that this guy Taylor McCaffrey had his head suspiciously placed in a video where he claimed that a sunken train was actually an ancient Egyptian chariot in order to hide the very obvious train wheel that was there behind his head. I'm not entirely convinced that that was on purpose, since the rest of it still doesn't actually look like a chariot, but the wheel is the most obvious giveaway if you're not paying close attention. In response to that video, which got a grand total of about 2,000 views across both YouTube and TikTok, this TikToker with more than 600,000 followers blocked me. So now I'm making a video response to him on my main channel that'll get more than 10 times the views of the short. Still basically nothing when compared to his size, but hey, if 2,000 views bothers him, then I imagine that more than 20,000 views will bother him more. Also, the video I'm responding to has been taken down, probably for spreading misinformation, so hopefully mine doesn't get taken down too, since YouTube is notoriously bad at distinguishing between videos that spread misinformation and videos that correct the misinformation, but yeah, I'm gonna risk it anyway. Let's go! Have you noticed the huge push that all these major food companies are trying to get people to stop eating meat? This is one of my favorite things. In my experience, most of the people who complain every time a company starts offering a vegetarian option on their menu are the same people who advocate for less regulation, claiming that the free market will automatically self-regulate, as serving the needs of the customers will be the most profitable thing to do, and customers always notice when they get ripped off. That's why no company has ever done it before. But then, when restaurants realize that there's a whole segment of the population that doesn't eat meat who will be more likely to come to their restaurant if there are vegetarian options, suddenly that's trying to push plant-based products on us, trying to force us not to eat meat. Like, relax, buddy. They have plant-based stuff because it makes more money for them. Like, when I'm out and about with my kids, if I need to grab fast food for lunch, Burger King is most likely to get my business. Not because that's my preference, not because their burgers are any better than the other garbage burgers at the fast food places, but because that's the one that has the most vegetarian options for my daughter. I still get a gross disgusting burger with two meat patties on it and a bunch of bacon and other crap that is probably going to kill me at some point, but their having a plant-based Whopper did not stop me from getting that. It just made me more likely to get my gross, disgusting, too much meat burger at their restaurant instead of the competition, because they also had an option for my daughter. And yet somehow, this catering to market demands and offering more options to satisfy more people is seen as trying to shove the plant-based products down our throats, as though it was somehow made harder for me to order my meaty burger as a result of them also having a burger for my daughter? And actually, you know what? It is slightly harder. The plant-based burgers take longer for them to make, so if we go through the drive through they'll usually have us park and wait for our food. Oh, horror of horrors. It's so inconvenient. Well, it turns out there's actually an insidious plan behind this. Watch this. Yes, the insidious plan of making more money by catering to the needs of more people. How horrible. Isn't that supposed to be the whole point of capitalism? Henry Kissinger, one of the world's elites pushing to set up the system that the Antichrist will use to take complete control, said in the 1970s, control oil and you control nations, control food and you can control people. And that's exactly what the elites of the world desire. Oh, okay then. Just gonna jump right into the anti-Semitic part of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Usually the one world government type conspiracy people try to hide the anti-Semitism a little deeper than that. Like, Kissinger was a controversial Secretary of State. He accomplished some really good shit in his career, but he also seemed, eh, to put it mildly, more than willing to turn a blind eye to war crimes. And then after he was done being Secretary of State, he went into consulting, which is something that a lot of Secretaries of State did. So why single out Henry Kissinger? It's not because of that quote, since that quote isn't something that he ever actually said. That quote seems to trace its origins back to a 2011 satire article on the Daily Squib. The same article also quotes him as having said, We're like the sharpshooter daring the noob to pick up the gun, and when they try, it's bang bang. But you don't see that quote floating around anywhere. So yeah, if that whole having a vegetarian option is them trying to force us to not eat meat thing hadn't already put me off, the fact that they're taking a quote that originated on a satire website seriously would have done the trick at this point. 
Like, that whole article has Kissinger explicitly describing the Prepper's fantasy scenario, where the best way to survive the one world government that will arise after the next clash of superpowers is to have a farm out in the middle of nowhere with lots of guns to fend off the starving people who are going to try to steal your food. If this dude were actually part of a secret cabal of world leaders trying to bring about this scenario, do you think he'd really openly admit it like that while simultaneously describing the ultimate prepper fantasy as exactly the thing that'll keep you safe in that scenario, which is something that these people supposedly do not want us to know? And it's not like it was hard for me to find out that this quote was originally published on a satire website. It was super easy, actually. Barely an inconvenience. And for those of you who don't think that just having one of the supposed higher-ups in the secret cabal of powerful people who control the media and world be Jewish automatically makes it anti-Semitic, this whole conspiracy theory has its origins with people who take the Protocols of the Elders of Zion seriously. If you're unfamiliar with that document, it was fabricated as Russian anti-Semitic propaganda meant to exacerbate the anti-Jewish riots, or pogroms, that were happening as Imperial Russia expanded its territory to include areas that had large Jewish populations, with Jewish people being blamed for the assassination assassination of Tsar Alexander II, even though only one person involved was Jewish, and her role in the assassination was fairly minor. Before the protocols were published, most of the pogroms happened spontaneously, and the government at least attempted to make it look like they were trying to stop the riots, but after its publication, a number of them were incited by the authorities, and the ones that were spontaneous were supported by the secret police. And if any of the perpetrators faced any legal troubles as a result of their actions, they usually received clemency directly from Tsar Nicholas. So, yeah, when the entire basis of your conspiracy theory rests on anti-Semitic propaganda meant to incite violence against Jewish populations, your conspiracy theory is anti-Semitic. Now, the elites of the world are the people who are at the highest levels of government, international, and corporations internationally. And these people are meeting to try to bring the world under one government, one control system. And along with that process, they're trying to get us used to the fact that the food that we're used to eating, at least in the Western world, is not going to be available or is going to be too expensive. And we should really get used to eating bugs. Okay, so what I find really amusing here is that Taylor is using this video to explain why vegetarian options are becoming more common. But insect-based food is not considered vegetarian. Well, I mean, opinions differ depending on the reason someone is vegetarian. They might be okay with insect-based alternatives, but my daughter, for instance, is not. She's a compassionate vegetarian who avoids eating meat because she doesn't like the idea of killing an animal. I've talked to her about potentially using things like cricket flour, and she's not comfortable with that. I mean, she doesn't even like it when I kill bugs that get into the house. Except wasps, because fuck those scary-ass monsters. She's not happy about my killing them, but she doesn't object when I do. Also, another reason this video might have been taken down from Taylor's channel is that he just straight up stole the whole thing. He's just playing someone else's video on his channel, with no commentary, no giving credit, no linking to the original, none of that. Just straight up theft. So the person who made it could have issued Taylor a copyright takedown notice. Also, I do recognize the irony of me choosing a video that does not belong to Taylor as my spite response to Taylor. Probably should have gone with original content of his, but yeah, whatever. We're here now. The World Economic Forum, who is probably the leading group, public group, of elites around the world who get together and try to make up rules unelected, make up rules on what we should be doing as a world. Yeah, the World Economic Forum is problematic to say the least. But it's not like there's some governmental entity that actually decides on policy and enforces those policies. They're basically a lobby group of crony capitalists who like to have big circle jerk meetings every year. Yeah, they do impact policy, but not directly. They do it through the lobbying of elected officials. Fix the problem of lobbyists having too much political influence in general, and the specific problem of the World Economic Forum will also be solved. Yeah, that's not an easy problem to fix, but if it's one that you actually wanted fixed, then fear-mongering about a bunch of baseless conspiracy nonsense while advocating for fixing it is counterproductive. If you want people to take you seriously, then ditch the nonsense. I think we can both agree that the World Economic Forum should not be as powerful as it is, but you don't need to pretend like they are secretly actually running the world in order to advocate for stripping their power. And so, kind of like the world government, the heads of it, unelected, they make the rules. Here's some articles on their website, why we need to give insects the role they deserve in our food systems. Okay, I feel like this whole video is just going to be them complaining about insect-based foods. Like, 
yeah, to people in most European-based culture systems, eating insects evokes a visceral yuck reaction because our culture thinks of insects as gross, so we go through our house killing all the creepy crawlies we find, even the ones that actually eat the harmful creepy crawlies. Like, centipedes are pretty much completely harmless to humans, and they eat a bunch of insects that we consider pests, like cockroaches. But the default reaction to seeing a centipede in your home is probably to kill it, and I'll admit that I have that same reaction. They don't want to hurt me, they just want me to leave them alone. But that's just too damn many legs, and the way they move is just... Ugh. And yes, I did just use the term creepy crawly to refer to centipedes in order to avoid the pedants telling me that centipedes aren't actually insects, because they have more than six legs. I'm probably gonna mess it up in this video, but I will try to use the correct terminology. Anyway, there are many cultures throughout the world where eating insects and other arthropods is already normal. In fact, Taylor is a Christian who takes the Bible very literally, as we learned from his video about finding chariots from when the Egyptians chased down the Hebrew slaves as they were escaping. Well, the ancient Hebrews who wrote that story also ate insects. Leviticus 11 tells us that you're allowed to eat crickets, locusts, and grasshoppers. And of course I'd be remiss if I neglected to mention the fact that this is also where we learn that winged insects that go on all fours are unclean, except for the ones already mentioned. Which is a fun little biblical error, since part of the definition of an insect is that it has six legs, and it explicitly talks about the winged insects having four feet. Like, yeah, I could give it some leeway in that the taxonomic system that defined insects as having six legs didn't exist back then, but it didn't just use all fours as a euphemism for walking. It explicitly said winged insects that have four feet after listing the exceptions, which are winged insects that have six feet. So no matter how you slice it, it is factually wrong here. The world's population will reach 9.7 billion people by 2050. This means that despite only 4% of arable land remaining available on the surface of our planet, an additional 2 billion more humans will have to be fed. Yeah, that's a real problem. As the population increases, so does our need for food. And there's only so much farmland available, so we need to make the most efficient use of this farmland. And that does not mean that we all need to become vegetarians who also eat bugs. There is a place in farming for animals. They can often be fed on land that can't grow crops that humans eat, so using that land to raise animals that we can eat is more efficient. Now, that does not mean that there isn't a huge problem with using land that could grow crops that we eat actually being used inefficiently to raise animals. My point is just that in an idealized, perfectly efficient farming system, there is still a place for meat. Also, it'd be helpful if people could ditch their attachment to organic farming. It's actually worse for the environment than intensive conventional farming. It's just a fact of organic farming that it is less efficient. It uses more land than conventional farming to grow the same amount of produce, and since we've already maxed out the best farmland, then in order to remain sustainable with a growing population, we need to increase efficiency, not decrease it by farming in a way that is, at its core, based on the appeal to nature fallacy. Like, to be certified organic, you can't even irradiate food to give it a longer shelf life and reduce foodborne disease, because radiation is scary and unnatural, even though it doesn't cause the food to become radioactive or harmful in any way. Also, contrary to popular belief, you can use pesticides and still be certified organic. The pesticides just have to be naturally derived. There's actually a massive list, the Organic Materials Review Institute list, of pesticides and fertilizers that can be used in compliance with the USDA National Organic Program standards. The problem here is that naturally derived pesticides, like copper sulfate for instance, tend to be significantly more toxic than the artificial and highly targeted pesticides of conventional farming, and also tend to be less effective, causing them to be much more heavily used. Also, GMOs are going to need to play a key role in meeting global food demands, which are expected to increase by 50% by the year 2050, and despite them being incredibly promising when it comes to increasing the nutrient density of food without increasing the land use to grow the food, the use of any GMO product is an automatic disqualification from being labeled organic. Like, golden rice is rice that has been genetically modified to significantly increase the vitamin A content of rice, which has the potential to prevent hundreds of thousands of deaths and cases of blindness per year due to vitamin A deficiency in countries with large, poor populations that use rice as a staple part of their diet. It has been developed by a non-profit organization, the science is all open source, and with the exception of having to license a handful of already existing patents in order to make it in the first place, the development of golden rice has provided scientific results that are patent-free. 
And yet this crop that has so much potential to save lives and prevent blindness can never be certified organic, because it was genetically tweaked to produce beta carotene in a lab rather than bred to do it in the field. Which, let's be real here, none of our food is free from genetic modification. But preferring the modifications that happen by breeding is more natural, so that's how it all has to be done. Also, these natural breeding modifications are much less controlled than lab modifications, and lead to all sorts of unintended consequences, like the reduction of disease resistance. Oh, but the lack of genetic diversity would lead to the same thing with GMOs, right? Okay, so that's when we genetically modify the crop to have greater disease resistance, which we can do on purpose, rather than waiting for a resistant mutation to happen naturally. And yeah, I get that a key part of the pro-organic argument often takes the stance that we need to reduce world population, so that way organic farming would be able to feed the world. And reducing population is a stance that I generally agree with, but switching all of our farming to organic will accomplish that by starving a shit ton of poor people. I'd rather reduce the world population through things like comprehensive education, women's rights, poverty reduction, you know, the humanitarian stuff that will naturally lead people to reduce the number of children they have. You might even say it organically reduces the number of children they have. Also, I didn't even get into the fact that organic products are a boutique category of products. They will always be more expensive than the non-certified comparable products, just by virtue of the production inefficiencies that result from the methods that organic farming uses. So the ability to buy organic is a privileged position. People living in poverty don't have that option, and making all food more expensive by producing it all organically will not be helpful to them. And now that I've called out a conspiracy theory for being anti-Semitic and talk shit about organic farming while praising GMOs, I have successfully pissed off a bunch of people on both the right and left. Yay me! Actually, now that I think about it, this is a nice little insight into one of the key differences of worldview on the right and left. The people on the right that are mad at me are mad because I called out an aspect of something that usually shows up on the right that is inherently problematic. Well, on the left, the origin of the pissed offedness is in a disagreement about how to make the world a better place. With the obligatory hashtag not all whatevers here, I'm not saying that all people who lean right are heartless conspiracy theorist nutbags, nor am I saying that all lefties are organic loving hippies who don't care about lowering the world population through starvation. I do recognize that there are nuances here. The splitting of these issues on the right and the left are generalizations that do not always hold true. Isn't it just interesting on a side note when they throw out these numbers of people and how this overpopulation number, then didn't we just have a pandemic? Like, shouldn't that number be going down? Well, the answer to this one is fairly straightforward. According to Johns Hopkins University, there have been an estimated 6.9 million deaths due to COVID worldwide since the pandemic started. So that's about 2.3 million deaths due to COVID per year. Now, how many births are there per year? Well, according to the United Nations World Population Prospects, the birth rate has been an average of 17.87 live births per thousand people for the three full years of the pandemic, which translates to a total of more than 400 million babies born during the pandemic. Now, I know math isn't exactly my best area, but it seems to me that 400 million is a larger number than 6.9 million. But I mean, that's specifically COVID deaths. I mean, maybe when you add all the deaths together, it'll get to a point where- No, no it won't. On average, about twice as many babies are born as people die in any given time period, including COVID deaths. There's even a nifty little website you can go to that visualizes the data, making it easy to see. So yeah, this section of the video is refuted by the mere fact that some numbers are bigger than others. Like shouldn't used cars be plentiful and houses be plentiful because, you know, pandemic, a lot of people die, but no, here they are complaining about overpopulation once again. Pandemic aside, there actually is plenty of housing. There are enough vacant housing units in the United States to house every homeless person in the country 26 times over. The problem of overpopulation has never been one of, is there enough physical space for people? It has always been, are there enough resources to allow everyone to have happy, healthy lives? And the answer to that question is actually yes, there currently are enough resources, but the distribution of these resources is heavily skewed towards the wealthy and powerful, so we need to figure out how to address and mitigate these distribution issues, creating a more equitable world in the process. But also, if the population continues to grow, we will get to a point where the lack of resources ceases to be a logistical problem and becomes just a fact of life that there isn't enough to go around. 
Also, I can see the organic farming enthusiasts typing now about how there is enough food, so we can all go organic even if it results in less food being produced. But that ignores the fact that one of the reasons for the distribution problem is that people in wealthy countries can afford to have their produce shipped to them, while people in poor regions rely mostly on what can be grown in their region. They can't afford to buy produce that was shipped in from elsewhere, and if we all switch to organic farming, then the local farms that they get their food from will now be producing less food, thus exacerbating the problem. And that's not even getting into the fact that higher demand from wealthy areas will end up with more food from the poorer areas being shipped away from the poor areas to service the needs of the wealthy. Like, look into the causes of the Irish potato famine sometime. It was literally a problem of foreign landlords using Irish farmland to produce crops that could be exported, resulting in the people who actually lived in Ireland trying desperately to live off of dense crops that can grow in relatively poor soil that wasn't being devoted to export crops, which mostly meant potatoes. There was plenty of food in Ireland during the famine, it was just being sold to people who didn't live there, causing the people who did live there to starve. And these people must think no one ever flies in airplanes, because if you do, you can see that the majority of Earth has nothing on it. Do these people actually take this sort of argumentation seriously? Do they really not realize that overpopulation is not a problem of physical space, but of resources, and the distribution of those resources? Like, this is obvious, right? This isn't one of those things that I think is obvious, but it's only obvious to me because I spend way more time reading about topics like this than normal people. Here's another article by the World Economic Forum, and these are within the past few years, but this is an agenda that they are completely pushing and aiming for, and they will continue to. And right now their focus is on food shortages and food inflation, which I'll get into here in just a minute. Okay, but there, you just said it. The reason that people say we are overpopulated is because of food shortages. If there's not enough food, why would the amount of land matter? Unless you think that all land is equally able to be used as farmland, which is just not the case. Although, because edible insects are generally pretty easy to breed and grow, it would be easier to use land that is currently unsuitable for farming for the farming of insects. So your whole there's lots of physical space thing would actually have a tiny bit of merit if you were more open-minded to the eating bugs. But this article says good grub why we might be eating insects soon. That's July 16, 2018, World Economic Forum. And within the article, they praise nations like Switzerland, who in 2017 changed its food safety laws to become the first European country to allow insect-based foods for humans, and that within Swiss marketplaces, they unveiled a range of mealworm burgers and mealworm balls to eat. The pictures being used are showing full-size mealworms for shock value, but like, this is more what it would look like. Yeah, the color's not quite the same as a beef burger, but it looks fine. And I've actually eaten straight up full-size mealworms before. I seem to recall that if you fry them up with a bit of butter, it actually tastes like popcorn. But that was over 20 years ago, so I might be misremembering. I do remember that we burnt the crickets though, so the chocolate-covered crickets were gross. But that was more because they were burnt than because it was actually bad. Although... <sighs> chocolate-covered crickets, I don't know what I was thinking, whatever. This is the kind of teenager I was. Teenage me didn't go partying with his friends. Teenage me knew that everyone thought that bugs are gross, but there are actually plenty of edible bugs, so he'd do the gross thing that is perfectly safe just for the shock value. As well as Ikea, I guess, the, the furniture company has an innovation lab called Space 10 that's reimagining popular dishes at the retailer's in-store restaurants, and they're working on bug burgers and mealworm meatballs. You know that they have a restaurant, right? Like, that's one of the things that everybody knows about Ikea, isn't it? The way you said that made it sound like it was a surprise to you, but that's one of their most prominent gimmicks. So yeah, the furniture company that is known for having a restaurant now has bug-related menu items in their restaurant. And as with the vegetarian options, it's an option. You can still just buy normal meat. Also, insect meat is just healthier. It's got more protein, less fat, and is rich in a bunch of essential nutrients like amino acids. If it could also be made to taste good and doesn't leave you picking antennae out of your teeth, then I don't see a problem with it. Also, I said it was on their menu, but I actually can't find anything more recent than 2018 about the IKEA mealworm meatball thing, and according to all of those news articles, it doesn't actually sell them in their restaurants, they've just got an R&D team that is working on ways to make their food more sustainable, and insects were one of several potential ingredients that could accomplish that. But the lack of follow-up suggests that you still can't go into IKEA and order insect meatballs. Maybe someone from Switzerland can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where it stands as far as I can tell. 
And yes, don't at me, I know that IKEA is Swedish, not Swiss, but he was talking about Swiss regulations allowing them to serve insects and stuff, so that's why I said Switzerland. If you're Swedish and you can correct me on that, then yeah, by all means do that as well, but yeah, whatever. Of course, their main push that they're doing with this, which they will continue to, will be the climate. This will be what they're trying to do saying that the CO2 emissions of animals, as well as the water usage of animals, is the reason why we need to start eating insects. I mean, yeah, it's more environmentally friendly to raise insects than cattle. That's not really up for debate. It's kind of a brute fact. And it's true whether you believe climate change is real or not. Well, I mean, climate change being real is true whether you believe it or not, so I guess it's kind of a meaningless distinction. But I think that even the most ardent of climate change deniers would find it hard to argue against the fact that crickets are more environmentally friendly than corn. And more of the same for basically all the other crops and types of livestock. They even put up these little charts on their website to show just how much less gases insects use and how much less water they require. Yeah, see? Even if you don't think that greenhouse gas emissions cause climate change, it is undeniable that they cause pollution, and if given the choice, wouldn't you rather live on a planet that is not polluted? Even you can't pretend that insects actually produce more pollution than other livestock. Even though we live on an earth that's the majority water, for some reason these people just can't, you know, desalinate the water and put farms next to the coast. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, why not? That definitely wouldn't be a massive and unnecessary infrastructure project, sure. It's not like it takes 3.8 kilowatt hours of electricity for every thousand gallons of water desalinated, and it's not like cows need about 10 gallons of water per day, making a cumulative total of 105.5 billion gallons of water for the 28.9 million cows in the United States, thus requiring an increase in electricity production of 400 million kilowatt hours per year, enough to power 36,000 homes. And that's just cows. Let's not forget about the chickens, pigs, sheep, and all other types of livestock that all need water. And the crops that need water. All of those things need water too. And then of course, all the land by the coast is obviously perfectly able to grow all the crops that we need. Water is the only consideration. Soil quality doesn't matter, right? Not to mention the fact that there are lots of countries out there that have zero access to the oceans, so they'd just be screwed out of all their food production. And even if we did go this route, I'd be willing to bet that you don't like the idea of renewable energy. You probably advocate for fossil fuels. Well, that extra half a billion kilowatt hours of electricity ain't gonna come from nowhere. That's a lot more coal and natural gas that needs to be burned in order to make that electricity. And even if you're against green energy for some reason, you do recognize that burning coal and natural gas produces pollution that causes a bunch of health problems, right? Like, that's not a controversial statement to you, is it? You know what? I'll never understand the people who advocate on behalf of fossil fuels being used for energy production. It's just so obviously bad that even if you don't think it causes climate change, you should still want to transition to green energy just for the sake of having clean air. But that's where they're buying up all their houses at, so there's no more room there, even though they say the sea levels are rising. And once again, we're kind of in agreement here. Coastal development is something that I can agree is a problem. But do you know who owns those seaside homes? bunch of rich people. The majority of the population will never own a home on the coast. And do you know what the people who own coastal property do with it? They build seawalls to keep the encroaching ocean at bay, as properties that are not protected by seawalls have their yards eroded away as the ocean levels rise. There are investment blogs that advise against using beachfront property as an investment because, as the ocean erodes away the yard, the property value goes down. So once again, with coastal development, we have found a common problem that we both agree is a problem. But because you surround it with all this conspiracy bullshit, people won't take you seriously, and so whatever solutions you might propose will also not be taken seriously. It's the same thing with the United Nations and Agenda 2030, how they're trying to bring everything into sustainability and through saving the climate and doing everything we need for the climate, this is how they're going to try and control the resources of the world. They're going to put everything on climate and we're seeing them starting to do that now with the banning of gas cars and the controlling of how much energy people use. I wonder if he listens to himself after he records his videos. Like, he's talking about sustainability and protecting the climate as if those are horrible things that should be avoided at all costs. Why? Oh no, 
Heaven forbid we live in a way that is sustainable. Far better to just live a consumption-driven life, trying to consume all that's available to you, leaving nothing for anyone else. Also worth mentioning is that the gas car ban is not a ban on gas cars per se. It's not a requirement that all cars in California be electric by 2035. It's that all new cars sold in California will have to be electric, which gives them plenty of time to upgrade their power grid to accommodate the increase in demand that this will create, build new charging stations so there's not a question of where you can charge your car when it needs it, and to improve the technology to make it cheaper and increase the available range. I mean, really, I don't actually understand the resistance to EVs. They are objectively better than gas vehicles in basically every way except range. And most people don't go outside the range of most EVs on a regular basis. Hell, even for the people that don't like it when things are green for whatever reason, there's still plenty of pollution in the mining of lithium for batteries. I mean, significantly less than the pollution that results from driving a gas car for its entire lifetime. But it's still there and is a problem that needs to be addressed. So until it is addressed, you still have your pollution and vehicles. Here's an article from last month, August 23rd, 2022, cricket powder showing up in your food. Here's a couple of the packages of some of the items that have cricket powder showing up in them. Some of them you wouldn't even know if you just saw this bar sitting there on the side without like reading everything about it, you wouldn't realize that there's cricket powder in these things. Oh no, heaven forbid we have to actually read the packaging to figure out what's in it. It'd really suck to have to live life with the same inconveniences that people with allergies already regularly experience. Also, for the record, that pause that happened in the video was on Taylor's end. It wasn't my fault, it was Taylor's fault. I'm blaming him, I'm passing the blame along to him. I know how to get videos off of YouTube without relying on screen recording. He apparently does not. But we can see that that's definitely where they're trying to push things in the direction. They're definitely trying to get us to try to get used to the fact of eating bugs. It's really, truly probably like a satanic type of degradation thing where these people just live off of harming and being rude and crude to other people. I mean, that's what happens when you're demon possessed. They are cruel to people. Did you hear that? People from cultures that have been eating bugs since before white people even existed? Y'all are apparently a bunch of demon possessed degenerates. Like. This dude is completely ignorant of other cultures and then acts as though things that these other cultures do is because of demon possession. Is that low-key accidental racism or high-key overt racism? I mean, he did mention that it was Western cultures earlier, so he is aware that other cultures eat insects, so he knew that when he said that, so I'm thinking it's the high-key overt racism kind of racism. I mean, really, talk about being scared of what you don't understand. Like, what kind of fragile snowflake do you have to be to think that the availability of food items that are distasteful to you are literally the result of demonic possession? Grow up, buddy. And to bring it back to the reason Taylor decided to show this video in the first place, does that mean that Taylor thinks that having a vegetarian option at a restaurant is a sign of demonic possession? All of this is coupled with the food inflation that we're seeing. Everyone knows that the prices of food are going up. It's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you can't even eat out. You can't eat anywhere cheap anymore. Things that used to be just 10 bucks eating out are now $17. It's completely ridiculous. Again, holy crap, we agree on so much. There's so much that we agree on. Just ditch the nonsense. Just ditch it. It's conspiracy crap. You don't need it. Like, yeah. Historically high food prices while minimum wage stagnates and the companies selling the food are raking in record profits is a huge problem. Not because of a secret cabal of Henry Kissingers that are trying to control the world population, but because the people who are actually directly responsible for these higher profits are trying desperately to convince people that the price hikes are out of their control. It's just supply and demand, it's how the market works. Never mind that if the price hikes were actually because of market forces then profit margins would have stayed the same. Dude, you are so close to actually getting it that it hurts. But I guess that's how conspiracies spread. Point out real problems that are obvious to most people, and then tie it back to the secret cabal of Kissingers who run everything rather than looking at the real reason. Because using real solutions to solve problems is harder than just blaming the secret government that controls everything that we can't actually do anything about. So why bother trying? Let's just make videos pointing out how shit things are and not actually propose any solutions to make anything better. Yeah, solutions are hard. I don't mind you being lazy, but could you please try to do it in a way that doesn't actively make things worse for those of us actually interested in solutions?
And that's it for this one. Congratulations if you managed to make it to this point in the video. Either I didn't piss you off, or I did and you at least wanted to fully hear me out before bailing, so well done. And if you are pro-organic farming, before trying to argue in the comments, I would ask that you just go through my source list and actually read the stuff related to organic farming. I used to be pro-organic and anti-GMO as well. What changed my mind was evidence. I haven't abandoned my skepticism when it comes to being anti-organic, it's just that the evidence is against it being environmentally friendly or accessible to people in poverty. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Clockwork Meyer, who says, quote mining is okay because the opponent is a quote miner? What the fuck is that hypocrisy, Rhino? I've been a long time fan, this is disappointing. For context, lest I quote mine myself, or this person, this was on a video where I played that bit where Matt Powell said that he doesn't see anything wrong with quote mining, followed by a clip of him saying that the reason that school shootings happen is because the Bible says that God made us in his image. And yes, had I left it at that, that would have been a dishonest quote mine. But that's not where I left it. Let's hear what I actually said. Now that I've mentioned Matt Powell and the school shootings thing, I have just two Powell clips that I feel obligated to play. The first is Matt explaining that he doesn't see anything wrong with quote mining. Well, I don't see anything wrong with quote mining. And next is Matt Powell explaining the real reason that school shootings happen. Hey, the Bible says that God made us in his own image. And that's why a lot of these school shootings happen. And yes, that is a dishonest quote mine on my part, as I already mentioned Powell thinks school shootings happen because of atheism. But since Powell doesn't see a problem with quote mining, I don't see a problem with quote mining him. Now, yes, had I just played the Powell clip saying that school shootings happen because we are made in the image of God and provided no other context, that would indeed have been a dishonest quote mine. But that's the joke. The fact that I didn't just leave it at that. I went on to explicitly state that it was a dishonest quote mine on my part, while providing additional context about what Powell actually believes. The point of me using those clips is to make it abundantly obvious why quote mining is actually a problem. You can make anyone say anything with quote mining. I did point this out in a reply to this person, but apparently they missed the part of the response where I explained that it's not really a quote mine if you actually do provide the context needed to correctly understand the person's position, and just use it as an example of why quote mining is bad, and only heard the I did it as a joke part, so he took that to be the it was only a joke defense, which is a pretty terrible defense for a lot of problematic behavior online, so sure, I could see why that would be annoying. Anyway, just to put everyone's mind at ease, here's the quote in its full context. If you tell a kid long enough, hey, you're an animal, you're an animal, you're an animal, eventually they're just going to break down and feel like they're worthless and that they're not made in the image of God. Hey, the Bible says that God made us in his own image. And that's why a lot of these school shootings happen. And it's becoming more and more prevalent today as time moves on. Okay, so the full context is enough to let you know that he thinks that believing that you're not made in the image of God causes school shootings. But also that he really sucks at speaking, so he flubbed his way into accidentally saying the exact opposite of that, because even in context, that sounds like a self-contained sentence. Thanks for watching, thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Fred Smith, Peter, and all the rest, who are the real problems that are pointed out by the conspiracy theory that is my channel. If you'd like to not be taken seriously because of your proximity to really bad ideas, then you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!